You're all now veterans of, of the Gettysburg battlefield. And I've already heard from this section of the room, which shall remain unidentified individually, that some of you were more impressive on the picket Pettigrew reenactment than others. <laughs> that some of you lagged behind. If there had been true file closers, you might not have made it uh, through the assault. But here you all are, at least it seems like all of you are here. A bunch of you are here anyway. I'm interested in impressions, and I'm interested in what you found to be the most striking <coughs> dimension of the landscape. There's no substitute for going. Maps don't do it. So what, what surprised you? I think what surprised me was the ridges and the hills were <laughs> the ridges, so yes. much less, it's, I don't know, they were much smaller than I expected. They are. So. Smaller to us, but in a military sense, we'll talk about that. They really matter. Chris? So I agree on that. And then the opposite direction is Devil's Den and uh, Little Round Top. And cool that. rocks in Devil's Den. And that's just crazy that they tried to run up that and, and come through and attack that way. <laughs> they didn't just try. They did. Yeah, they did. Yeah. <laughs> so I, that's what I was going to say, too. Even, even the Little Hills, you really realize how much more difficult it is in fact to, to attack a fortified position yep. than when you read about it. So yep. they ran up the hill. No, maps don't show it. Heather? Um, I think just on Pickett's charge, like knowing, like so we went to the Union side first, so we kind of knew where they were, and so when we actually did the walk, like just knowing that you can't see anything, and you're basically you go down like, and up. a yep. death march. Like you're just walking into like gunfire artillery or whatever. It's, That's that correct. so long, like I can't imagine actually continuing to walk that way. <laughs> <laughs> While people are dropping left and right. Now, did they, so you started at the angle and then looked out toward the, were you kind of opposite the Virginia Monument and looking out from there? Did they give you a good sense of how wide it was when it started? Point out, they didn't. The McMillan Farm off to your right and the Spangler yeah. Farm yeah. off yeah. to your left. So it's a mile. Yeah. Yeah. It's a mile from flank to flank. Yes? So it's one of the things just how the sheer distance traveled, like for, for Monument on day two, where he started the day and where I'm like, Attack the the line that the main was a tiny part of. Yes, that's. Well, that, that, was just that, furthest I hear it was the far left. There was no one farther no, left than no. there. That was it. But from yeah, it's kind of the furthest point from yeah. march to march. Uh huh. Just marching that and then attacking much less marching. It well, and the and what had the what had the regiment that first attacked the 15th Alabama that, that actually slammed into the 20th Maine, what had their day been like? Where did they begin their day? You know where Longstreet began. He was over on Route 30, parentheses, right. the Chambersburg Pike. But where was, the, where was the Alabama Brigade that the 15th Alabama was part of? That's a very nice, that's a good way to put it when you don't know the answer. You're going to go a long way. <laughs> they were way back there toward Cat. No, they were. Yeah. They marched miles before they got to the rest. And then they ended up marching about 23 miles that day. And they lost their canteens. So they had no water. The guys they sent out to get water got captured. So they had no water. They climbed up to the top of Round Top and then down and then attacked Little Round Top. That was their day. Uh, their day was a hideous day uh, compared to the 20th Mains. Yes, Scott, this is an aftershock. Well, I was going to say that I was, in, I would, I, I didn't realize how important the roads were and how they like defended. You know, that's how they set up their positions were based on how they could get access to the Baltimore Pike. And you look at why is the Baltimore just, Pike so important? Because it goes to that is the main artery for the Army of the Potomac. If the Baltimore Pike goes, they're really in trouble, really in trouble. And if things had gone badly at Culp Hill, Culp's Hill, you're right on top of the Baltimore Pike if you're the Confederate. So yes, roads mean everything at Gettysburg. On the first day, the roads are the problem for the Union defensive positions. They keep setting up positions, and Confederates come in on roads that are behind the Union flank. Yeah, the roads are everything, and, get, and a bunch of them come in at Gettysburg. Major roads from every direction. Jim? We often make the assumption that when you didn't take the hill because it was practicable, when you stand on the hill, it might not have been as practicable. How about when you stand at the bottom of the hill? 
even less practical. Yes, it's even <laughs> less practicable. Especially when you don't have all your guys. It's well, you don't ready. know what's up there. We know yes. where everybody is, so it's easy for us to say they should have done this or that. Uh, I cut Ewell slack, even though I don't think he was a very good corps commander, but right there, he was being prudent, I think. Prudent. You, your understanding of how important terrain is definitely changes. So put that in mind with Lee and Longtree, like standing there and just still like seeing everything in front of them and understanding after two days the Union line mm -hmm. and still deciding to go through with Pickett's charge just seems like... It's even tougher sell for you to be on board with Lee now after looking oh, yeah. at that. <laughs> How come you're not right here? You're usually sitting right there boldly in the front ranks. Oh, sorry, I've said you today. <laughs> Uh, so one thing that really impressed me was like the issue of authority, like with Mead and like Hancock, they were like because of, I mean, uh, the Mariner in our group team said that nobody can have more stars or equal stars than Washington. So there was an issue like in the Army of the Potomac, most of the, the higher generals were like the same level. We talked about that. They're all two, what we would call a two-star general. Nobody's a three-star general until they make Grant a three-star general yeah. in 1864. No, yeah, but what I didn't remember was that Meade was also equal. So well, they're equal, but they're not equal because some get their, their two stars before others do. And they, believe me, they know who has the earlier rank. But it's a problem at Gettysburg on the first day because Winfield Scott Hancock who Meade gives charge of overall charge before Meade gets to the battlefield, it was promoted to Major General later than O.O. O. Howard was, who's on the scene as well. So there's a little bit of tension there between them. Howard ranked Hancock. They both are Major Generals, but Howard's rank was earlier, and so Howard was a little, he, was, he behaved pretty well, but he was not happy about the fact that someone junior to him in terms of date of rank was put over him. Yeah, the Confederates have four ranks. We talked briefly about that. The U.S. gets three uh, with, with Grant as lieutenant general at the end. Luis? Yeah, we were talking about the sight and the scenes and the distance. So it's not only like we see the hills that is like high or low. It's just you cannot see anything behind them. It doesn't matter <laughs> where, where you are there. If you are in the highest place, you, you won't see very far, maybe no. three miles, five miles. And that was like the major issue in the... They didn't have the towers we, we went? No, those towers, alas, were not there yet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's one yeah, why is it hard to build a tower like that at that time? Well, it was hard to build it while a battle was going on. Yes, they didn't build those towers while battles were going on. But those are War Department towers built in the late, very late 19th yeah, century. Yeah, no, so, so then that's like hard to communicate, to see things, sure. to plan, to strategize, to know where they are. So. Thinking on the map here was, oh, just here we can see everything. No, you cannot see anything like for one mile, two miles, something. No, 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 no. And we talked last time about Edward Porter Alexander's critique. All Alexander could see of the battlefield, he was over on Seminary Ridge. He could look, he saw that part of the battlefield. He didn't understand what the northern arc of the battlefield looked like. And when he got there after the war and looked at it, he said, well, obviously we should have attacked where the fish hook bends because you can bring art you can get converging artillery fire there you can bring artillery from two sides on that and where he was firing from he could only bring it from one side so you have a very shallow target from where he was you have a much deeper target if you bring it from both sides because even something that overshoots a little bit will still likely hit some kind of federal target and they had, could have the same fire within each other right you make them yep yeah so yep. we're always discussing that theory, um, but, but um, that, that I think Lee didn't agree with that, but that was one interesting thing. If, if you bring them along, how long would you have to bring them to the other side? How many soldiers to the other side? Yeah, a, a, a long time. To bring somebody, you were over on the Colts Hill end. If you're the Confederates and you're opposite Colts Hill, if you're in Allegheny Johnson's division all the way over there, and they want you to reinforce the attacks against the wheat field, it's not an option. On the other hand, if you're the Federals opposite Allegheny Johnson on Culp's Hill and they want to bring you to the wheat field, they can do it. They did do it. And it's a very, all you, I mean, you just, it, it's, it's a relatively short march there. It's only a little more than a mile for them. For the Confederates, it would have been four miles 
So one side has the option, one side doesn't because of the tactical interior lines. Yes? I thought the timing of things was very interesting. When we were walking uh, Pickett's Charge, our group at least was saying, well, are we running now? You don't no, ever run. Running. No. Are you shooting yet? No, you're not shooting. When do you start to shoot? And that was asked many times, and it wasn't until... <laughs> you shoot when you get to the Emmitsburg Road. Right. That's the first time you get to fire your muskets. And actually experiencing that, I think we said it was probably 15, 20 minutes that we were walking, just saying, what are we doing? We're just getting shot at right should now. should take about 18 minutes to go from the Virginia Monument across. And of course, that's the shortest distance. If you're over on the Confederate right, where Kemper's brigade was, you're already you're all the way down by the Spangler House. You have to go as far north as you do east from there. Which mo I think most people think of Pickett's Charge as we're going just straight west to east, but the line is so long that it's really a huge northward movement for the right element of uh, for the right two brigades, Kemper's and yeah. Uh, we we talked about Buford again a little bit, and I didn't realize that Meade had thought about you know really wanted to set up his defense position farther south. Uh, and Buford was really Pike kind of, Creek line is what he had, right. yeah. and really almost staking you know a flag in the ground for the Union and and making a very bold claim for his superiors that this was going to be the place. Well, yes, he yes he staked his claim there. He was attacked there. I mean that's one reason he did it there. But yes, he did. And and when the first infantry came up, he persuaded Reynolds that that's a good enough place to fight. And so now Buford did a good job. He did a good job. It's it's not as it's not the job that the film or even Killer Angels suggest. They suggest there's more to it. Lasted about an hour the con the cavalry part of the fight. But as we've talked before, for cavalry fighting infantry, that's a long time. They weren't on their horses, of course. They got off their horses, and so a quarter of their strength is immediately deducted. The horse holders would every fourth man would hold four horses. But they did a good job. Yes. I think also. Um I got a new perspective on the peach orchard and all of that, and I think, like, it, it did make sense why Sickles thought it was so much better land. Like, it was oh, yes. a lot better land, but also it was even more, and I realized how much of a worse... It's better land if what? When, what makes it better ground? It's what? higher. It's so much no, higher. No, 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 I know that, but it's better only if what? If you go out and occupy that position... Only if your line continues the whole Only way. if you have a continuous line, that's right. right. So if you're down, I mean, if you're down Cemetery Ridge, and here's the Peach Orchard, and here's the Emmitsburg Road, and here's the Wheat Field, and here I should have started higher. Anyway, there's Devil's Den. So if you're going to go out there, yes, it's higher. It's obvious. If you're standing here and looking there, you're looking up. And what is going through his mind, as I'm sure the Marines told you, is what happened to him two months earlier, exactly two months earlier, when he had to abandon Hazel Grove, which we stood in. We, I took my Civil War class to Chancellorsville uh, on Sunday. We had a nice di day there, and we stood in Hazel Grove, and it's the key to the whole position on the heaviest day of fighting at Chancellorsville, and Sickles was ordered to abandon that by Hooker. And when he abandoned, the Confederates crammed 40 pieces of artillery in Hazel Grove, and it proved decisive. Well, he looked out here, and of course, imagine that crammed with Confederate artillery, uh, which it was as soon as the Federals were knocked off of it. Porter Alexander went out and crammed it with Confederate artillery. It makes sense, but it only makes sense if it's part of a continuous line. And the problem with it is that all of this ground is not as high as this ground. The only part that is, is that part. So, and it creates that salient out there. And what's the problem with the salient? Three sides. Pardon? It has three sides. Has three sides. Yeah, it has three sides. It's vulnerable from three sides. So, so you have a little more empathy for Daniel Edgar Sickles now yeah, than you did before. Yeah, but also more empathy, understanding why he would do it, but also more understanding of how bad it was for the position, for the line. You saw that all the parts of the field. Here's the peach orchard. This whole part of the Union line you drove along that road is nothing but artillery pieces. There was no infantry there. That doesn't work in the Civil War, not to have infantry. And he didn't have any infantry. Um, on that topic, our Marine and our historian, we kind of felt that Sickles saved the whole battle by going up there because he I'll bet they liked James Longstreet, too, didn't they? <laughs> Did you get a lot of love about James Longstreet there? <laughs> we didn't get his, it got more love than Laura gave him. But, <laughs> but um. Uh, because he, he blunted their attack. 
they, they couldn't concentrate. So they, they didn't have a problem with his having exposed an entire infantry corps and having his corps shattered by what happened. In the end, we concluded that he saved them. Really? Well, he would have agreed with you because Sickles always said he did too. He always said he saved the battle as well. Laura didn't agree. I want to hear your thoughts, Laura. <laughs> I thought Longstreet, I suggested that maybe we should have um, had rid of Longstreet. Right on the spot. And the Marines said that no one had suggested that before. <laughs> and that perhaps that wouldn't work. And I just was like, I don't understand. I mean, you have a subordinate who is not following orders. Surely you can find someone who can at least follow orders better. And, you know, he continues to not follow orders. And I just think that's, he's not trustworthy. And they said, you know, everybody argued that he had this long friendship with me. And he did. That's true. But, I but said, I then you should say, right, and? <laughs> so, anyway, I did not get a lot of support for my position, but I still maintain that Longstreet should have been out. So. Did you see the Longstreet statue? No. Yeah, you didn't? Did? They didn't statue. take you to the Longstreet statue? I heard of that. Laura, you would have loved it, because <laughs> it's a cartoon statue. It, it looks like a cartoon compared to the other statues. It's ludicrous. Uh, oh, that's a damn shame that you didn't get to see the Longstreet statue. All right, other thoughts? Scott. On that, on that same note, though, we did talk a lot about kind of the inner dynamic between the different leads, especially on the Union side, between um, like how Sickles was not a West Pointer and how he was kind of part of the. Right. We talked about that. He's the only outsider of all the high command, the only non West Pointer. And, uh, and considered a crude, sort of boorish, low politician besides because of his associations with Tammany Hall. And he was also in, but he was in like buddy buddy with Meade's chief of staff, right? He was buddy buddy, his main friends were gone. He had a couple of friends. He was sort of close to Butterfield. He was sort of, but he's not well connected at all with the rest of the Corps commanders. He's a pariah. He doesn't like them and they don't like him. They think he's an amateur which he was an amateur. He's, you know, pick your favorite politician from Washington right now and stick them in a major United States Army uh, along with all of the West Point trained professionals and that, that is what's Mitch McConnell and the generals. Or uh, pick anybody, that's who it is. Jeff? I was gonna say, my biggest takeaway was I thought the interaction with the Marines who were taking us around, that was probably the coolest part of it. Not only their perspective on the battle, but we actually talked about leadership stuff quite a bit. Bryce had them all saying, like, you know, go to Gemba and stuff, and then he should have went <laughs> down to the battlefield and seen things for himself, and why did he never do that? Who should have done that? We, we were saying, why did we never go and look at the ground that Pickett's men were going to charge over sooner, or to try to, like, you know, the idea of Hood getting around to the right, why did he never do that when the first thing we did when he showed up was to ride the battlefield? Well, Lee saw a lot of the battlefield. Lee rode all the way over to Colts Hill, not once, but twice. He rode down to where the Virginia Monument is, not once, but twice. Uh, he's got five miles to ride around, and Meade has a mile and a half. So first of all, it's easier for Meade to ride around and look. Second of all, I'm not sure you want your army commander out where he can get shot. John Hood got shot where he was. That's not where you want Robert E. Lee to be, I don't think. Yeah, I think our questioning was more that if he's not getting good information, he's getting such pushback, especially from his right-hand man, why is it he doing more to try to solve that himself? Because he doesn't know he's getting bad information. <coughs> he only knows what information he's getting. I mean, we know it's bad information now, but he doesn't know it's bad information. It's like criticizing Ewell for not knowing there weren't many Federals on East Cemetery Hill. We know there weren't. People often quote Winfield Scott Hancock to attack Richard Ewell, because Hancock said after the war, well, we only had this many men there. They could have easily captured this between 4 and 5 o'clock. The thing is, he didn't tell you all that. Um, he didn't send a note down through the line saying, attack us now because we're at our weakest. He did that retrospectively. So that evidence to me can't be used to attack Richard Ewell. It's something Richard Ewell didn't know. It's something that we know, retrospectively. But uh, it, it's, I mean, Lee could have spent, Lee on many battlefields was all over the place and almost got shot in a number of instances. 
Uh, at Gettysburg, he was all over the place, but not all the way down to the far Confederate right. He was not. He was not. Which would have put him utterly out of touch with the other end of his line, incidentally. Where he stayed, he was roughly equidistant from the two parts of the field, both of which had been ordered to mount attacks. He's not, it's not just Longstreet who's attacking, it's also Ewell who's supposed to be attacking. There are hands up everywhere. Uh, Janet, you haven't said anything yet. Um, this is un kind of unrelated, so if you want to keep going in this direction, that's We fine. can go any direction. Jeff, we can come back to just reload, and after Janet says, <laughs> we'll <laughs> revisit that. Um, I thought one of the most interesting parts was when the Marines at the end of Pickett Char Pickett's Charge read us the letter from Lincoln that he'd written Meade, sure. um, and then proceeded to not send, and just, you know, really hitting home that message of the importance of solidarity in the face of, you know, just the challenges that the Union had seen at Gettysburg. Is that the real point of that letter? What, I mean, what is the well, real point well, you would take from his, that letter? I think his not sending that letter oh, sure. is, sends the message of he realized there wasn't a lot of union leadership <laughs> left. And know, there's no beyond. point to hammering on right. Meade. But, but he didn't send the letter, but he knew that Meade had gotten the message because others had told Meade about the letter, and the fact that he didn't send it doesn't mean that Meade didn't get the message. He just didn't send it. No. He didn't send it, but he sent the message. And Meade knew that Lincoln was bitterly not just disappointed, bitterly disappointed. As disappointed as he had been when uh, McClellan didn't follow up his victory at Antietam the, the previous year. Jeff, can you tell us what the letter said? Because I grouped in. Here, well, here's what the letter said. I'm going to read it to you. <laughs> I will read you the letter. I thought it was in your packet. It was in the Am very I? last page of the, okay. the very, very last page. You wouldn't have seen it because they didn't tell us this. They, did they tell you to ignore the last page? <laughs> no. I, if it's in your packet, it's in your packet. Anyway, it's the very it's last page of your packet. While we oh, while well, you're on the field. So, yeah, so it's on the, the field. So I, can I mean, the key parts, I'm yourself. very, very grateful. Well, you can read it if it's in your packet. Lincoln basically says in the first part that he's, the reason I can't read this, Barbara, do you have reading glasses? May I borrow no, your no, reading no, glasses, please? Reading glasses. Oh, who has reading glasses? Everybody's too young. Well, Justin, I'm appointing you our town crier. <laughs> read that letter. What's the date on it? Uh, July 14th, 1863. Major General Meade, I've just seen your dispatch to General Halleck asking to be relieved of your command because of a supposed censure of mine. I am very, very grateful to you for the magnificent success you gave the cause of the country at Gettysburg, and I am sorry now to be the author of the slightest pain to you but I was in such deep distress myself that I could not restrain some expression of it. I had been oppressed nearly ever since the battles at Gettysburg, but what appeared to be evidence is that you, that yourself and General Couch and General Smith were not seeking a collision with the enemy, but were trying to get him across the river without another battle. What these evidences were, if you please, I hope to tell you at some time when we shall both feel better. The case, summarily stated, is this. You fought and beat the enemy at Gettysburg, and of course, to say the least, his loss was as great as yours. He retreated, and you did not, as it seemed to me, pressingly pursue him, <coughs> but a flood in the river detained him, till by slow degrees you were again upon him. You had at least 20,000 veteran troops directly with you, and as many more raw ones within supporting distance, all in addition to those who fought with you at Gettysburg, while it was not possible that he had received a single recruit, and yet you stood and let the flood run down, bridges be built, and the enemy move away at his leisure, without attacking him. And Couch and Smith, the latter left Carlisle in time, upon all ordinary calculation to have aided you in the last battle at Gettysburg, but he did not arrive. At the end of more than ten days, I believe twelve, under constant urging, he reached Hagerstown from Carlisle, which is not an inch over fifty-five miles, if so much, and Couch's movement was very little different. Again, my dear General, I do not believe you appreciate the magnitude of the misfortune involved in Lee's escape. He was within your easy grasp, and to have closed upon him would, in connection with our other late successes, have ended the war. As it is, the war will be prolonged indefinitely. If you could not safely attack Lee last Monday, how can you possibly do so south of the river when you can take with you very few of more than two-thirds of the force you then had in hand? It will be unreasonable to expect it, and I do not expect you can now much effect. Uh, do not expect you can now affect much. Your golden opportunity is gone, and I am distressed immeasurably because of it. I beg you will not consider this a prosecution or persecution of yourself, as you had learned that I, uh, learned that I was dissatisfied. I thought it best to kindly tell you why. That's a really strong letter. And it's the, it's the most wonderful evidence that 
Gettysburg was not considered the great turning point of the war at the time. Lincoln says the war will be continued indefinitely and that he is distressed immeasurably by the failure to follow up the victory. So it's, and as he notes, he knew that Meade, that Meade had already gotten the gist of this letter. That's why, he's, that's why Lincoln wrote this, but then didn't send it to him. So he's not really that solicitous of Meade because he didn't send this to him. He probably felt better writing it. Uh, and then putting it in the drawer. Yes? So was it general knowledge at the time? I know we know it now that Lincoln was really... Yes, general knowledge. General knowledge among people who were in the know. That is, the, the Union cabinet, the... I mean, and if, and if somebody knows something, everybody knows something. It's Washington. Uh, so there about, are no like, secrets. The civilian population? Pardon? What about, like, the civilian population? A lot of the newspapers talked about how <coughs> sad they were that the Army in Northern Virginia got away. And it's unlike Antietam, where Lee's army recrossed the river at night, one night. He got his whole army across the river in one night. And McClellan didn't mount a pursuit for five weeks. Five weeks. The beaten army gets across in one night. Well, here, Lee not only retreats and isn't harassed as he's retreating, he gets trapped because the Potomac is up, because it's been pouring. He's there 10 days. In response to that, I guess the, the Marines with us were talking about how Lee had very much built a defensive network and kind of breastworks, et cetera, and so... Built them after he got there. Yes. He didn't build them before he... They weren't waiting for him. Agreed. So a, a, a pursuing force pressing him when he got to the river would not have faced an entrenched enemy. But, but yes, they put him up very quickly, and the Confederate engineers laid out a wonderful line, and within a, a, a very short time, they wanted the Federals to attack them. I think the opportunity isn't six days down the road. The opportunity is when yeah. Lee's army, a retreating, battered army in motion across mountains, is potentially at least a very vulnerable army, especially when you've gotten thousands of reinforcements, as Lincoln says. And Lee's gotten none. And you had a whole infantry corps, your biggest infantry corps, the Sixth Corps, under your senior corps commander, John Sedgwick, didn't even fight at Gettysburg didn't even fight. You have a fresh core that hasn't even fought. So there are lots of ways to let Meade off the hook, but I think it's possible to make a pretty strong case that he should have tried something anyway. Well, just in kind of to go off of that, one of the things we talked about was how difficult it would have been for Meade to, to push the attack right then with his completely disorganized army and millions Is his people. army completely disorganized, though? We talked about how they, I mean, Sedgwick's, Sedgwick's right. core wasn't. It was clearly in order. But and was right there. I mean, could it's, they have mounted it's, an it's, attack with just one core? Would that have been enough? Uh, that core was as big as the attack that Pickett and Pettigrew mounted. So I would say the answer to that is yes, you could mount an attack with one core. Well, a core is a big, that's a lot of men. A core is a lot of men. So let's, like, regardless of whether or not he should have attacked, do you, like, thinking if. You can spin the story however way you want it. Doesn't Lincoln sort of do a disservice to the Union? Because he can arguably control the press and the way the civilians perceive it. And so... He can't really control the press, but he can... It's not... Influence. There's not a White House press secretary right. that had... That isn't in place then, so but it's not quite gets, the same. If the, pre, if the press gets the idea that Lincoln is dissatisfied with Meade, it just seems like something that could have been celebrated, that could have pushed morale in the North up and morale in the South what? down and arguably impacted the war as it, well. It, like, that's a mistake on Lincoln, isn't it? You could make that argument, so don't, don't say anything bad about a victory and just let the people be happy about it. Yes, and the people were happy. I mean, Gettysburg was a big victory. They were happy in the United States about Gettysburg. Finally, somebody's really defeated Lee. But there's also a sense, and Lincoln isn't the, I mean, the, 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 newspapers, the newspapers were intensely partisan then and they didn't pretend to be anything else. We've talked about that too. So the Democratic papers are always going to look for ways to critique what the administration is doing. And, and some of the Republican papers wanted Lincoln to push harder than he did, and so he can't control the press in that regard. But overall it's seen as a victory. It's not as important at the time. What makes it uh, less of a front page news story day after day is that Vicksburg happened at exactly the same time and Vicksburg is an absolutely unequivocal United States victory. An entire rebel army surrendered at Vicksburg and in fact Vicksburg hurts 
me a little bit because you say, well, Grant captured the entire army at Vicksburg and Meade let Lee get away uh, when he was, it seemed, trapped north of the river. Vicksburg in that way didn't help how Meade's victory was received. It actually diminished it a little bit, although not, not, I mean, for the most part, I don't mean to give the wrong impression here. They were really happy about Gettysburg. Gettysburg is a big deal. I have a question about just timing of communication. I mean, Gettysburg is not that far away from Washington. What, uh, if Meade was delaying some kind of a pursuing attack after the after Gettysburg, um, why why wasn't Lincoln notified? Why couldn't... Oh, Lincoln knew exactly. No, Lincoln so, knows what's going on. He knows that the newspapers had articles about the first day's fight in their editions the next day because of the telegraph. I mean, the, the, the news goes the news goes absolutely, uh, almost immediately. So was, was Lincoln, I mean, aside from letters that he didn't send, what were the instructions that Lincoln was giving to Meade? Well, it's Lincoln doesn't give Meade orders. Meade gets orders from, the orders go through the Army High Command. They don't, the president doesn't intervene and say, do this. The president talks to people, and then, uh, uh, Henry W. Halleck is involved in this. The General Couch, whom Lincoln mentioned here, is in charge of troops that are raised in Pennsylvania that could be brought to the fore. There are instructions, but you can tell someone what you want to happen, but you can't make it happen. <laughs> Just as Lee could tell Longstreet what he wanted to happen and couldn't make it happen, Meade is, is absolutely aware that the President and others in Washington want him to press the rebels. There's, he is not confused about that, and he knows that immediately, knows it immediately. Uh, on this topic, because actually we had this discussion with the, with the people there, and it looked to me that the orders that Halleck or Lincoln or whoever was managing that thing in Washington, because I think that's a, something I'm a little bit funny sometimes, but anyway, it was to put the army between Washington and Lee. That was, that were the orders. Those were the, in the initial orders, Yeah, yes. but the thing is that those orders never changed. Well, Yes, we could, we could argue that in a legalistic sense. We could. I, I just, I, I ask you to close your I'm, eyes and imagine. Yeah, but I'm just saying that Lincoln in this whole thing, I think it's a little bit opportunistic and saying, okay, why, you, why didn't you do this? Okay, sorry, you said me to do the opposite. If Meade goes on the attack and something happens, then Lincoln would have said maybe, hey, what were your orders? That is, that, that's a beautiful expression of the culture of command in the Army of the Potomac. You could not have said that or written it better, and George McClellan would buy you a bourbon one night if he could go out with you. These were my original orders. I've just repulsed the rebel army at enormous loss. They're retreating chaotically toward the Potomac, but I'm not going to follow them because my original orders were to stay between them and Washington. Even though they're retreating toward the Potomac now, I'm going to still stay here because those were my original orders. By the letter of those orders, you're absolutely right. An aggressive general who's really seeking to deal a knockout blow to somebody would not do that. And if you can just imagine swapping the top generals in this battle, I, I just, uh, if Lee had been in Meade's position, I can promise you there would have been a counterattack, not on the 4th, it would have happened on the 3rd. The assault was repulsed by 3 p.m. on the 3rd. There are four and a half hours of daylight left on the 3rd. You've got a corps that hasn't even fought yet, that's just a few hundred yards from the point of attack. So it's, it's just, we can defend meat, and lots of people have, and I'm attacking him more than usual just because I'm playing devil's advocate to all of you. I sense a real groundswell of, of Meadism in here. But, and, and he was in a tough position, absolutely new in command, this giant battle. He's lost a quarter of his army. Those are huge things, huge things. But the opportunity is an opportunity that the Army has not had quite like this before. You don't get a chance to beat the, the, the premier rebel army that is the absolute core of the entire rebel resistance. This isn't just a Confederate army that's on the ropes. It's the Confederate army that's on the ropes. The one that everybody looks to. Commanded by the man that's the most important man in the Confederacy. 
a truly decisive victory against that guy would reverberate unbelievably, <coughs> negatively in the Confederacy, positively in the United States. So wouldn't that be kind of the reverse in Pickett's charge, though, if they leave that position and they, the Union comes streaming across the sure. field and gets nailed by all this of course it would have, Confederate it's, artillery? Who's on Seminary Ridge now, where the Confederates left to launch their attack? Uh, Jeb Stewart. And no, Jeb Stewart's out <coughs> east of town doing what cavalry do. The answer is nobody's on Seminary Ridge. That was part of, there's nobody behind them. They went over, and now they're coming back in complete disarray. All the field grade officers in Pickett's <coughs> division, except one, are casualties. All the brigadier generals are casualties. There's not a single brigadier general left in Pickett's division. The division commander, old General Trimble, who's commanding one of the other divisions, he's a casualty. It's, it, is, it is massive command disarray on the Confederate side, with nobody behind them. So it's not quite the same as what's going toward the well-prepared Union position in the other direction. Yeah, so that was actually my question on the charge itself. Because what I don't, what I, there's many things I don't understand about the charge, but <laughs> the main being, even if they penetrate with no one behind them, what damage were they really going to do once they penetrated that point in the line with no reserve to flood it behind them? What is, Lee, what, what is right behind that position? <clears throat> The Baltimore Pike is right behind that position. And he sent Jeb Stewart out to the east, hoped that Stewart would get around and come in and find his way to the Baltimore Pike a little bit farther south from there. That's what he's hoping will happen. So he's hoping Stewart's going to come on the backside. Yes, and Stewart was off on the backside. He just didn't get anything done because the Union cavalry stopped him out there. And George Custer had a very good day. That's what he's hoping will happen. But it's, I mean, I don't think, uh, don't get me wrong, I think it was a bad decision to launch the picket Pettigrew assault with 12 and a half thousand men. And he's got a couple of brigades off to his right that he hopes will be <coughs> in supporting position, but it doesn't work that way. The main attack goes, it retreats, and then those two brigades go, and they go nowhere and, and to no purpose. So it's, and the, and the bombardment did not accomplish anything, really. He thought it would, and it didn't. Did not accomplish anything. Lots of noise, lots of smoke, and almost no damage. So one of our scenarios was, we're generally on the third day, what do you do? And we went through all the different options. Mm -hmm. What would you have? It, it, it made Pickett's charge seem less idiotic to me because he was picking from a bunch of horrible alternatives. It was, what did you see as a better alternative? I think his what best alternative done? was this, on the second day to just hunker down on Seminary Ridge and make me attack him. Oh, I, I think, well, yeah. I think After the huge success on the first day, let, let me attack us. Yeah, I like that too. Now you're on the third day, though. Dice cast, you attack, so now third day. You can still stay on Seminary Ridge. You think that sure, but until you've shot up all your <laughs> artillery ammunition before the assault. If you're talking about before the assault. No, I'm talking, it's the morning of the third day or the night of the yeah. second day. Okay, to so what's going to happen? Yeah, you, you still you have that. pretty full ammunition chests for your artillery on the morning of the third day. So you have a position on Seminary Ridge that is, I mean, it's, it's a gentle ridge too, but gentle ridges are almost perfect because there's no defilade in front of us. You can see them coming all the way across if you're on a gentle ridge like that. I, that's what I would have done. But that's not... How did they explain Lee's choice? Did they talk about Lee's own explanation? Did they talk about how he explained it to the president and to his wife? Yeah? These guys have never failed me before. I thought that they could... Like they're Virginians, I thought they would do it. Well, they're not. Yeah, that, the Virginian thing is so overdone. Fewer than half the troops are Virginians in, in the picket Pettigrew assault. The, the Virginian thing is so tiresome. Uh, less than half of them are Virginians. It's not that the Virginians have never failed him. It's that his infantry has never failed him. It's a much broader sense of trust than just his Virginians. Uh, there are Virginians in Pickett's division, but the other two divisions are not mostly Virginians. They're, they're North Carolinians and Tennesseans and, and lots of other troops represented. So, so they said that that particular uh, group had not been in the war yet. Mm -hmm. Is that true? That they hadn't been in a battle yet. They'd been, so in, they the been in the war. Yeah, had been not, they were the last battle. division up. Pickett's division so they were fresh. was fresh. It was the smallest division in the Army and the last division to come up. 
and it's all Virginians. Pickett's division is all Virginia units. It's only got a few more, but it's fewer than 6,000 men. But in response to that, we also talked about how Lee is supposed to be this fantastic general who has a great sense of land and just an understanding of, like, you know, he's awesome, everybody loves him, but now he's... Now he's a dope. He's in the north, things are different, it's not his territory, it's like... Okay, think about that. Think about that for a minute. Does that make any sense? I think it changes He's mentality. in the north. Are hills different in the north? No, but mentalities are. Are they? What's would, the difference? If I was a northerner and somebody was in my home, I would know. Oh, great. Let's talk about that. What state does the Army of Northern Virginia go into? It goes through Maryland. Maryland's the throughway. It's in Pennsylvania. Home turf. How do Pennsylvanians react to Lee's presence? Anger and fear. Anger and fear. Do the men of Pennsylvania rush to the colors? No, they absolutely don't. Harrisburg says, well, we'll raise troops as soon as Pittsburgh does. And Pittsburgh says, well, we're waiting for Philadelphia. And Philadelphia says, but we're waiting for Harrisburg. And so they wait and wait and wait. And the Army of the Potomac marches into Pennsylvania. And what the Union soldiers talk about is how many military age men are on all these farms that they're going past. Farms that are charging the soldiers for a drink of water. Oh, you want a drink of water? That'll be a nickel. They do cartoons about that in Harper's Weekly about the, the Pennsylvania farmers charging Union soldiers, defending Pennsylvania for a drink of water. Pennsylvania is pathetic in response to Lee's invasion. Pathetic. And the veterans in the Army of the Potomac are furious about that. God damn it, we're down here defending the goddamn Pennsylvania Dutch and they won't get off their goddamn asses and help us defend their own state. Only they used profanity uh, when they did that to make their point even stronger. They were livid with Pennsylvania. So the idea that you get a rebel army north and by God, the north turns out in a righteous fury is just not true. It isn't true. At the same time, though, I can see, so Hancock's men were <coughs> Pennsylvanians. Many of them were, yes. Yeah, Pennsylvanians. And so the difference between having to travel all that way to completely foreign land versus being close to your backyard and close to, it's one thing for the rest of Pennsylvania not to show up, but for, uh, for the soldiers themselves, I would imagine there'd be a stronger incentive. I don't think there's any question about that, Justin, but we were talking about Lee's being able to read ground when he gets to the north. He can read ground as well in Adams County. As he can in Stafford County. I mean, standing on the battlefield, gosh, there's a ridge. That's where the enemy is. That ridge looks a lot like a Virginia ridge that he can look at. But uh, I think there is a little advantage to, in terms of morale, that soldiers defending their nation rather than invading somebody else's nation probably feel that they have more of a stake in it. But I wouldn't push that too far because. We saw what happened on the first day. I mean, a lot of it is what's going on on the battlefield. The first day, those were northerners defending northern ground, and they absolutely got pummeled <coughs> by A.P. Hill and Richard Ewell on the first day. Jeff? Do you think Lee felt a sense of pressure, though? We talked about how he wanted to move the war into the north to kind of let the Virginian farms and let the south have a break. Right. Do you think between Davis and then himself putting pressure on him, him putting pressure on himself, that he felt like he had to attack the North and keep the war up there? Well, he wanted to keep the North up there by maneuvering, not attacking. He, I mean, he, as you all know, he wasn't planning to fight a battle on July 1st. He wasn't looking for a battle then. He was pulling his army back together to decide what he was going to do next. He, his army was all spread out, part of it almost to Harrisburg, uh, on, the, on the Susquehanna River. He used Gettysburg because of all those roads, bringing people back, and then he would, but still guarding the passes. You got to look at that great view of South <coughs> Mountain from Gettysburg. There was South Mountain, off to your west. And what's beyond South Mountain? The Cumberland Valley, which is where Lee had been doing so much wonderful provisioning of his army, a, a just an unbelievably productive agricultural area, the Cumberland Valley. As long as he controlled the passes in South Mountain, his army could do whatever it wanted on the other side. Uh, and that's where his army probably would have gone if the fighting hadn't started on July 1st, just through serendipity, really. 
he pushed it, as we've talked about, and as I'm sure they talked about on the field with you, because once he got there and saw what the tactical situation was, it seemed propitious for the Confederates. And so he pushed it and won a great victory on the first. It's a big victory. He just he basically wrecked two Union Corps on the first day. 50% casualties in the first corps and the, and the 11th corps. That's huge. What is a, I don't mean, what's the percentage? What, what, how many <coughs> casualties can a unit take now before it's considered? It's effect. Yes. Is it, it's not, got to be less than 20%. I think, yeah, around 20, 25% is, would be completely. <coughs> completely ineffective. Yeah. 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 And to think of a core suffering that many, I mean, that's, a, this is, those are, are terrible losses on the first day. Two infantry corps suffering 50% losses on one day. That's, that's a big, a big setback for the Army of the Potomac and a big success for the Army of Northern Virginia. And I think that always has to be factored into what ensues and because of the momentum that Lee believes was generated there. Now, everybody didn't. Longstreet obviously didn't. Any other impressions? Anything about the terrain that, I mean, did Little Round Top seem taller than you thought it would, shorter than you <laughs> thought it would? About what you thought, or just exactly what you thought it would? No surprise there? They, they made some comments about um, these scouts that went and supposedly got to the top of Little Round Top and um, how that <laughs> was probably just bogus information because they didn't tell them anything about Devil's Den and like that would have been so obvious that that position would be impossible to take on. Um, well, the, yes. The staff officers got, they certainly got to the peach orchard that very early morning when they went over there. And what they did know is there weren't, there was nobody on Little Round Top. They knew where the Union line ended and it ended up on Cemetery Ridge, considerably north of Little Round Top. That's where it was. The last intelligence Lee had, the end of the Union line, stopped well short of Little Round Top. Little Round Top was empty and Round Top was, of course, too. Yeah, in, in regards to the terrain, like on the first day when Buford decided to position himself on that ridge. I, I, when I was reading, I had picture like something a hill, but it's just like turf. Michelle, that 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 is true. But where you really get a sense, and you didn't have time to do this, where it really becomes a ridge is if you go down into the low ground. There's a creek that runs in between. McPherson's Ridge, which is where Buford's main position was, and Her Ridge, which is the next one to the west, where the Confederates deployed. When you go down into the bottom and then come up, it is really a ridge. I mean, it is really a ridge. And the Confederate infantry that came up out of that bottom and ran into the Iron Brigade, for example, on the first day, it's, 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 it's a very steep climb. It's a ridge that's a very intimidating ridge if you're the attacker and are going up that ridge. I understand in reality most people, when I look at that, I mean, just a few centimeters makes such a huge difference. I was like, I just could not picture that. And I don't, I still admire how those guys see that, you know, for me it's just a, <coughs> a knob and a turf. Well, there, the one th Meade was a, Meade was a topographical engineer. He, one of the things he could do is read ground. <coughs> that, he was good at that and he could see quickly, but Lee was a brilliant engineer. He was one of the best engineers in the army. Uh, he could also do that. The best people at West Point became engineers. That's who the top uh, graduating members of the, almost always, they had their choice and they chose engineers. Uh, the very top were engineers. Yes. How much of that was training from West Point and how much at this point was like sickles? I've seen this before and I know what's going to happen. Well, the, uh, there's no way to parse that. They, but obviously both go into it. And, and a soldier as old as Lee had seen a lot, and many of the other ones had been there too, they'd seen a lot in Mexico as subalterns. They had seen ground there, they'd read ground there, they'd all done all kinds of different things there. So they bring, they bring everything to a battlefield. Chris? And one of the things when my group was walking Pickett's Charge is we caught, kind of talked about what you can see as you're walking. So it's like, oh, okay, you, you'd see them. And Tell me, what did you start at the Virginia Monument? The Virginia okay, Monument. and went straight across pretty yeah. much. So there's points where you're walking, and you don't really notice any any kind of perceptible change in the land, but all of a sudden you're like, oh, wait, now you can see nothing. Can't even see the road. Can't even no, see the road. can't even and see then, the road. And then you walk a few more minutes, you can sort of see again. And we, we were talking about that, how it really, I mean, their visibility was very poor about kind of, vast majority of the Union Army because they're kind of like behind. They don't like, have no, the big just, picture. They don't really no. understand what they're walking into. No, 
what you you have a good sense of what's pretty close to you on either side and that's pretty much all you have although one thing you can see as you walk across and I'm sure they pointed it out to you you can see Little Round Top the entire way and there's Union rifled artillery on Little Round Top that's firing into the Confederate right flank the whole way there's no hiding from that artillery in that position They're, they can see you the whole time <laughs> Brian? I guess one thing on Pickett's charge that I didn't really have an appreciation for too is how far <coughs> north they're coming and how much you're funneling in which I think you mentioned, but the Union troops can kind of start to, on the southern end, can start to swing the line in a little bit, so it becomes that much They do. I mean, what, off the side. at the end, I mean, the, the, if this is the Spangler farm and this is the McMillan farm, that's a mile. So pickets, and pickets on the right-hand side, and down here are Trimble, and it's a mile from side to side, and here's the Union line, and there's the tops of trees right there. That's the target. These guys go as far north as they do east in the assault. And the whole thing, of course, sort of bunches together. Uh, when they get to the Emmitsburg Road, their front is maybe 500 yards wide instead of a mile wide. They come together that much by the time they get there. But they are, there's a little round top here. They can always see everything. They can see everything all the way. And the poor North Carolinians, I don't know if you noticed the North Carolina Monument, it's a beautiful <coughs> monument, Boots and Borglum sculpted it. The North Carolinians aren't out of sight. Theirs is a very gentle dip down and a very gentle climb up. They're in sight the entire way from when they start until they get there. The Virginians, here's the Virginia Monument, as you did, they go down and then up and then down again and then up again. They're out of sight twice. These poor guys are never out of sight uh, from the time they start. And, and they're the ones who break first. Most of them break. Some of them even before they got to the road, Dustin? Not to play the game of what if. Was there any historical evidence of doing kind of pre-dawn raids or something, um, you know, earlier in the day, et cetera, or later A in the evening? A pre-dawn raid to, say, for example, to Pickett's grab a little round top? Or, 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 yeah, or say even Pickett's charge at 6 a.m., you know, or at first light step off. Maybe it, there are things that try to get going at first light, nothing in the dark. They, I mean, they fought on Culp's Hill a little bit in the dark, but control, mm -hmm. it's hard enough in the light to control people, and it, they just don't fight at night during the Civil War. Almost never. Almost never. There's a huge assault at dawn at Spotsylvania on May the 12th, 1864. Uh, it has a shorter distance to go, and 20,000 Federals come out pretty much right at first light and roll over the Confederates <coughs> when the sun is barely up. That's the biggest example of that kind of thing. But here, of course, that wasn't possible because the troops weren't in place and they hadn't decided on what they were going to do soon enough to have a really early morning assault. As we were walking, they seemed to indicate that the casualty numbers weren't that great until you got like to the Emmitsburg Road at least and you were within infantry range. Is that, do you agree with that? That like the artillery from the north hitting the south even was not that alone didn't like decimate their lines. Yeah, we have no way to figure out what the relative casualties were, but the heavier casualties begin when they come within infantry range. Yes, infantry is always what does the most damage, and the Union infantry doesn't really start firing. I mean, there's a. I'm sure they talked about the Connecticut regiment that was out uh, well west of the Emmitsburg Road, and they were firing from there and then fell back. But the, the really heavy musketry didn't start until they got almost to the road, almost to the road. So, uh, but I think there would have been, I'm sure there were uh, two or three thousand casualties probably <laughs> out here. Because only about 500 Confederates finally got across the stone wall. I mean, there's, they bunch together, and as they talk to you, the Vermont guys come out like this, and the 8th Ohio comes out like this, and the main Union line is here, so when the Confederates got here, they're taking fire from three sides when they get in there. They've moved into this three-sided, uh, <coughs> terrible uh, killing ground in there. It's, and, and virtually none of them come out. They either surrender or they become casualties in there. Not much they can accomplish by then. One other interesting thing, coming back to the lines of sight, um, a couple of groups did it differently. So when we were looking at Devil's Den uh -huh. uh, and coming across on the, the first day, did you walk? Um, some of the groups walked from some of the groups walked from where from where Peach Orchard. Uh, Peach Orchard. Uh, we walked from the Peach Orchard up to Little Round Top. From the Peach Orchard. Okay. 
Nobody actually did that, but that, so you went from... That's the road to Okay. <laughs> okay. So some of the groups took the bus, and it was interesting. I was on the group that took the bus, and just having a different vision from, you know, two, two pictures in my mind of what you're looking at as the Confederates coming across. Right. And not seeing any of that. Right. And what you're looking down from Little Round Top and seeing all of the craziness that they're about to go through. It's just a very different um, perspective on it how defensible a position is, how quickly they can attack. So you must have imagined yourselves, I'm a, you went, you, uh, you had to go to where the 20th Main was. I can't believe they didn't take you there. Oh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Keep right. Okay, what about that? What is that ground? Is that ground what you thought it was going to be like? <coughs> Elizabeth, what, did you think it was going to be higher than that? <coughs> I mean, it was pretty dense. Like, Lots of trees. Yeah. Yep. I don't know what I expected. But, but it wasn't that. <laughs> So what I, what I struggled with there was, they talked about the clause troops running into that line several times, right? After you run into it the first couple times, and you realize that this, I mean, I'm assuming they at some point realized they were on the flank. Why, why didn't they move further? Well, what they kept doing. Because there aren't that many people occupying the position, right? So, like so here's a little round top. 300 people 20th Main goes down there, and they attack like this. But then they, they keep trying to work their way. This is what they're doing. They're trying to work their way around Chamberlain's left flank. And as they're doing that, Chamberlain, his, his regimental front is first this way. Then he takes half of it and puts them in that position. So now he's facing two directions. But what they're doing is trying to get around his flank. They can't lose contact with the people next to them, and that's the problem. It's the 15th Alabama, then the other Alabama regiments, and then the, the 4th and 5th Texas are over here. That's, they're the ones who are attacking Little Round Top, and you can't go off, you can't detach from, from your supporting units. You've got to keep contact on your left. And that's why they're doing that. But they thought they could get around, and in the end, they couldn't. Did you go to Culp's Hill? Yeah. You did. Okay, I want to hear what you heard at Culp's Hill. What's the story of Culp's Hill? I mean, we talked about, this was where Green... Uh -huh. and Old Man Green, he's the oldest general in the army. And, and how he had been in West Point as a professor and then gone out into the civilian workforce and then came back mm -hmm. and how he still just um, performed admirably and also kind of had this inventive way of having individuals go back and they were reloading and even drinking coffee during the, during the actual fight. battle, mm -hmm. which I thought was really interesting and also interesting that that wasn't something that was shared within the army, the Indian army. Well, there may have been other coffee consumed in other parts well, of the, the Indian Army. <laughs> and that happened, too, in other places. But Green did a great job, and he ends up as the only, with 1,800 men. He's all that's left over there. Did they talk? I'm really curious. Did, yes? Yeah, they also talked about how he dug in and fortified, and the younger troops were kind of not buying into it, so that they were over from how pivotal that was to having fewer men. And, and you saw the remnants of the breastworks that go all the way down the hill there. <laughs> <laughs> Did they talk about the 137th New York <coughs> at all? No. And Colonel David Ireland, did they mention them? Yes. They did. And how they're the exact equivalent of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, yeah. Yeah. only they were facing four times as many men as Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain? Yeah. Well, I guess, so the back of the statue, you know, around the 20th Main, though, talks about how I guess the 20th Maine came to Appomattox and was part of the general surrender to the Confederacy. Right. So it's not just us, in hindsight, thinking, oh, you know, or elevating 20th Maine or a particular movie elevating. Oh, it absolutely it was, is, yeah. Justin. No question about it. Yes, it is. But that particular unit was singled out to then be there. No, they weren't. They were part of the 5th Corps, which happened to be the Corps that was right. there. Why they were singled out is because Joshua Chamberlain wrote about it. He wrote a book called The Passing of the Armies where he pretended he was in charge of accepting the surrender. And he wasn't. He was in charge of his brigade at the surrender. His superior just didn't write an account of it. So, and I love Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. He's a college professor <laughs> who functions in the real world. Think about that. <laughs> who doesn't embarrass himself and all who know what he does for a living in the real world. But no, 
The 20th Maine is not special at Appomattox. It happens to be there when the Confederates come and surrender. They're, they don't say, what's the best, oh, little round top, get the 20th Maine up here right now. No, nobody is saying that. Nobody's saying that. Our guy was pretty down on Chamberlain and also pointed out that he was a politician. That's uh, later. We can't Aaron attack him about that. Yes. He started publishing some yes. Yes, he was three times governor of Maine and president of Bowdoin. Uh, yes, he was. And so was the, the Confederate colonel there, William C. Oates, was just like Chamberlain. He wrote a thousand page book about his experiences in the war, which he modestly titled The War Between the Union and the Confederacy. So he is sort of the Confederacy, I guess. And he became governor of Alabama after the war. He and Chamberlain, were, they shared a lot of characteristics. Um, there's been a sort of reaction among some insiders to Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain because he became so famous that the, get, the, the, get, the kind of inside the Gettysburg Beltway take on him is that he gets too much credit and so they, they make a t-shirt that says Joshua Who on it. You may have seen some of those. That's the, that's the counter reaction to Chamberlain becoming so famous. His regiment did a good job, Justin, but, but they did not stand out on the battlefield at Gettysburg. Uh, they, their, their casualties were heavy, but not unusually heavy. Uh, and they did a good job. But the, the heroes, who were the heroes of Little Round Top were the men who actually fought at Little Round Top. There are two Union officers who were singled out by the men who actually fought there. They both have statues on Little Round Top. Strong Vincent, who was what? What was his command? Uh, Chamberlain's. He's Chamberlain's brigade commander. Yes. And who's the other one? Who has the best statue on Little Governor Round Top? Warren. Governor Warren, who just yeah, has that statue, which is looking yeah. off toward the Confederates. It's just on a rock uh, on the north. Those are the two. Those are the two heroes of Little Round Top for the Civil War generation. For the Civil War generation, it is Warren who said, "Get troops up there," and it's Strong Vincent whose brigade went up first, and, it, and Vincent was mortally wounded. Uh, in the fighting there. They're the, two, they're the two heroes from the time. But we talked a little bit about how Strong Vincent, when he pulled up there, he was kind of like, I'll take responsibility for not being where I'm supposed to be. And like he showed a lot of initiative there. He did. Um, and obviously was rewarded because it worked out. But um, in a lot of instances where initiative was shown, it was penalized. And um, I don't know, I thought that, that was a, a unique it, you weren't penalized based on whether you obeyed or disobeyed the orders general necessarily. It was more if you survived and did all right, you were praised. If now, you, I, Scott, you can't be surprised by that. No, but I'm surprised that, that guy, some of these guys that are held up as like heroic for disobeying the orders are, you know, have that stature, but then like guys that didn't <coughs> take the initiative, even like Longstreet, are really like condemned for that. The coach tells you that we're going to stall for 20 seconds and you get an open shot and hit a three-pointer and win the game. You did exactly what you weren't supposed to do, but you're, good, but you're not going to be criticized for that. But if you miss the shot, you will be. I mean, I think it's the same syndrome there. <coughs> There's not compared, that much initiative. A lot to like in, in banking, Right, like or trading, you make like a huge trade that's outside the parameters of what you're supposed to do, and if it's successful, you get bonuses. You get promoted in bonuses, yeah. probably. And well, I guess the discussion was more about like, is that a good way to lead? And so, I don't, I don't so let's talk about that. I think it's a. Um, I think it reward. It provides the wrong incentives. I guess. But what's the writing saying? What should Strong Vincent have done on Little Round Top? Different from what he did do. Well, I really like that he put the 20th man on the end. Um, <laughs> now here it was way over on the end. It was as far as you could get on the end. I, I, don't, I don't know, and I think that, but, and maybe that was the right move. Maybe, like in a lot of business situations, we say like you should be able to have a decentralized structure that gives people the authority to make those decisions. But then, if they make the decisions and they don't go as well, like we talk a lot about in business school, organizations that don't like, don't scrutinize failure and like incentivize people to take 
uh, take the initiative, and, and maybe that's what should be the case. In the, you know, I think it's a little bit different in army when you, in an army when you know you have to act as in a complete unit. But um, I, I think a lot depends on the organization. Well, but th go make that a broader question and relate it to me. You do something in one of your companies that proves to be extremely successful. And you make a lot of money from doing this. And it opens up an opportunity with a little risk to make a great deal more money. But there will be additional risk there. What do you do there? What do you do? Do you, do you seize the opportunity to make a great deal of money? Or do you say, this has been great. This has been extremely successful. We're going to consolidate these gains. And now let's talk about what we're going to do next. What are you going to do? That's, that's me right after the picket Pettigrew assault. A tremendous <coughs> success and an opening for a much greater success. Which one of those do you do? That has to happen in business all the time. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think it, you, you need to be able to take a step back and say we made these gains. I mean, it's, if for a lot of people are in the, in the reading seminar too this week and we read about long-term capital management, and a big part of theirs was like, they hit the peak and then tried to keep pushing um, they had a good thing and tried to get a great thing, and if they had been able to back up and had a little more risk management, you know, they could have avoided the failure. And it's hard to say that that might not have been the case if Mead pursued on the third day, um, too. So. And what what might we say if he had pursued on the third day? Depends on how it turned out. Yeah. What what a fool! How could he possibly go after a dug-in defensible? <laughs> Lee, no, was, but he's not dug in and defensible yet. He was backed yet. into a corner with the. the he's not river. at the corner yet. Well, I'm no, not going to let you slither <laughs> out of this trap that easily. He's on his way to the river. He's on his way to the river. But yeah, it's just to me, it's all just so much armchair quarterbacking. Of course it is. Well, right. it has to be armchair quarterbacking. That's right. all we can do. But but that's what I'm saying, and it's the same thing with business. I mean, it, it happens all the time, right? There's there's Wall Street off Wall Street Journal no. office. No, here's what day. doesn't happen all the time. I'll disagree with you to this degree. This does not happen all the time. The biggest rebel army has lost a third of its entire force. It's encumbered by 50 miles of trains trying to get to the Potomac. 50 miles. They're spread out on roads all over that part of Pennsylvania. The ambulances, the supply wagons, the artillery, they're all in different places trying to get to the river. They're, trying, they're hauling back thousands of wounded. They have, their high command has lost one third of all the general officers in the army are casualties. How many times in the war does that happen? Once. Happens one time. So this doesn't happen all the time. That you win a great victory, have the big rebel army on the ropes, and have a chance to push. Doesn't mean you have to push. Doesn't even mean that maybe you should push. But it's not something that happens every time. It's something that happens once in the war. And this is the time it happened. This is the time it happened. And George Meade happens to be the guy who's in charge the time it happens. And he takes your second option. This is a great victory, and, and, and it was a great victory. Yes? You mentioned before that when a unit loses 25% of their people, it's not able to combat. And I think the Union Army lost 25% or more of their people. That's Justin said that. OK, but yeah. I, I mean, I would try Justin here because he has some experience in the, in the, in the issue, right? So I think when you lose 25% of your people in, the, in a battlefield, it is right. The other guy has lost 30%. But maybe you're in a very good, you are not either in a very good safe to start pushing <coughs> people around. Right, and, and the difference... And Sebuig is 20,000 people only, and so he might be facing like 50, 45, 45 50,000 people that have, fought, <coughs> that have been fought, uh, battling for long, but still they are formidable opponents. So oh, they are. are. They are formidable. They're easy to go, oh, let's go over there. No, but what's your, yes, you're leaving one little piece out of your picture there, and that is that there were 30,000 Union reinforcements that were on the scene within two days. So in other words, that makes up for all of the Union losses plus 8,000 more men in two days. And Lee's reinforcements are zero because he's north of the river and he's cut off from Virginia. So there's, there's a difference there. That, that's a significant advantage to the United States in the aftermath of Gettysburg. Well, just 
I feel like the meat should have pursued because originally when uh, Hooker was in charge, he wanted to go after the Capitol, and he's like, no, your responsibility is the Army of Northern Virginia. So that's why I feel like Lincoln was so upset, obviously, from his letter, because if they defeat that army, it's over with. So you needed to try and pursue that opportunity, because that's your responsibility, is taking care of that army and decimating it. I'll be honest, I don't think you can take the Pickett's Charge example and like put shit into business. Like Our group tried to do that too, and I just don't feel like there's an analogy that works that's of the same magnitude as the opportunity that he sort of gave up. Following Pickett's Charge, you mean? That's what I yeah, mean, yeah, 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 sort of the aftermath of Pickett's Charge. I mean, it just, I, I can't think of an analogy, and maybe there is one, but I just, <clears throat> I mean, it, <clears throat> because of the, the way that it could have ended the war, and Lincoln makes that clear, I feel like that's such a large, Thing. And that's such an ongoing thing that affects the entire you know, United States and where we sit today. I just can't think of something where a business decision would have. How about a decision there. that could, could drastically affect the future of a company, however, <coughs> if you go one way or the other? To right. push something to try to get a really stratospheric profit as opposed to just a really good profit, maybe even better than you expected to get. I mean, the only way I can see it is if by me not acting or something or by the business person not acting, the company goes into bankruptcy or something like that, which isn't the end of necessarily of the company, but nope, you've like no. lost right. um, a potential opportunity. I mean, I, it has, I feel like it has to be in like extremes, and that seems like a hard The fate of the nation is probably not going to rise right. or fall on any decision any of you ever makes. I'll agree with there's no question about that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, yes. I, this might be a really dumb question, but if... Lee was like, you know, me goes after Lee, kills Lee. Is the war really over? Like, it's, does Longstreet it's over take pretty over? quickly. But Longstreet can't command an army. No, if Lee's gone, I can't imagine the Confederate resistance. I mean, Longstreet can command an army, just can't command it well. I, but they'll, so they'll keep fighting. But you well, they'll keep fighting happens. for a while. But the only person who wins any victories for the Confederacy, basically through the whole war, any victories that amount to anything, are, is Lee. And he's important so far beyond just what his own army is doing. Uh, it's, it's hard to, there's nobody comparable to that now in our society. I can't say, well, Lee, as people look at, looked at the Confederates looked at Lee the way we look at, there's nobody like that in the United States now. There's no equivalent. So if he had killed Lee and like... Or even, ca you don't have to kill him, just, <laughs> just, just capture him. <laughs> capture him. <laughs> well, I don't mean like, you know... Okay, I'll kill him. him. All right, you know, really, go for it. Okay, they kill him and Monterey pass. <laughs> have potentially hurt the Confederates rejoining the Union as opposed to? I think that if you take Lee out of the equation, it's hard to imagine how the war could have continued even another year. I, I just don't know. I, I can't imagine this scenario because there's, there's nobody waiting in the wings to replace him, either as this symbol who transcends military affairs or as the only field commander the Confederacy ever found who could actually command an army really effectively. He's the only one. So I guess I'm wondering if the bitterness would have been even... Well, I think the war, you mean, would Reconstruction have been less bitter? Yeah, or more bitter. I don't think it would have been more. It'd be hard to imagine it being more bitter. I don't know. I, it would have been very bitter because emancipation was on the table, and that's really what's at the heart of the bitterness in, 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 in Reconstruction. It's that you've overturned the entire social structure of the former slaveholding states. That's the problem. Yeah. Is there some risk that without Lee, though, it turned into a, like a modern day Afghanistan with guerrilla warfare? I thought when yeah, the war much ended, of a risk. he kind of told people like it's over. I, I, I don't think, there's almost nobody, I, I think that's an <coughs> anachronistic way to look at it. That was very popular in the wake of Vietnam. Uh, and a number of historians wrote about the Civil War that way. They said what the Confederacy should have done is waged a guerrilla war from the very beginning. Duh, that's how a weaker side defeats a more powerful side. Well, that's a perfect example of why you shouldn't try to figure what should go on 150 years ago by what worked 20 years ago, because times are incredibly different. And if your goal is to establish a slaveholding society, the last thing you want is a guerrilla war, because you cannot control an enslaved population <coughs> in the midst of a guerrilla war. A guerrilla war brings chaos. It brings, it brings judicial chaos and political chaos. 
social chaos, and they had readily at hand the example of the revolution when more than half the slaves in Georgia were freed, a quarter of all the slaves in South Carolina were freed, a huge number in Virginia were freed because of the presence of British armies. An army comes into your neighborhood. If you're a slaveholder, you can forget maintaining effective control of an enslaved population. There's no way the Confederacy is going to fight a guerrilla war to establish a nation. They want to be a nation. They don't want to be a bunch of guerrillas. And the way you become a nation is you establish a government. You have a national army, a national navy. You have institutions that people in Paris and London recognize as national institutions. If you're not doing that, you're just a rebellion. You're not, it's not a war between nations. They want people to perceive this as a war between nations. And a nation, in, a, in the Western framework, and that's all they care about, is not an entity that wages a national war for independence with guerrillas. They may have some guerrillas, there were in the revolution, but the key isn't Francis Marion in South Carolina, it's the Continental Army and George Washington, and that's what's going on in the Civil War. Now, would, there, would it have been nasty? Sure, it was nasty anyway, but the, the idea that that could have been the primary, I see this making a little comeback in the literature on the Civil War. I guess enough time has passed, everything comes around again. It seems to be coming around again, but it just you, you can't read anything about the people who established the Confederacy and think they would have embraced the guerrilla war. And none of the famous generals would have. They would, that would have been anathema to them. That's not how you fight. It's not what you do. It doesn't lead to anything. It leads to chaos. Drew? So we talked a lot about um, Meade's council war mm -hmm. the second. Did he do that at all in like the night of the third or in the... He had two councils of war. He had two. He met twice with officers. But the more famous one, the famous one, is the one on the night of July 2nd where they got together and they actually voted on what to do. They actually voted. I'm just wondering how that could have played in at all to his decision or lack of decision? Well, he, he said he'd already decided that, that he, I mean, he'd made some decisions already, but what he, what, what he decided to stay, but he wasn't sure what he was going to do if he stayed. Was he going to launch an attack? Was he going to hold his ground? That still remained to be seen. Uh, but he, he did, he, he polled people, and there was a tradition for doing that in the Army of the Potomac. Other officers had done that too. Hooker had done that during the Chancellorsville campaign. That's not the tradition. Lee, I'm sure the Marines explained the difference. We talked about it here, and I'm sure they did too. Lee went and talked to his Corps commanders, but he didn't go and poll them or say, let's reach a collective decision here. He, he didn't, that's not the way he operated. Although he did listen to them. Yes, Luis. Um, but then, how do you know that Lee would allow him to be kept with you? How do I know that Lee would... Would allow him to be captured. Allow himself to be captured? Yes. Oh, I don't think he'd go down, you know, swinging his sword in some futile gesture if he were, if the Federals... He did allow himself to be captured in the end at Appomattox. I mean, he surrendered. I think he would have... I think if he'd been put in an impossible position, he would have surrendered. But it would have been... I mean, it would have had to be a desperate position before he would do that, as it was at Appomattox, with no alternatives. Because let's say that Meade decides to attack, even in the rain or whatever, mm -hmm. and then, well, Lee sees that uh, uh, I might have to retreat regardless. So <coughs> let, let me disguise, put some guys in the front, and everybody in the back just go. Take off. Yeah, and he goes with the guys. Yep. That's it. He will be free again. I mean, he will do like Saddam. He will escape and then go back. and then He would escape. But he wouldn't have escaped across the river. <laughs> That's the, he would, he, he would have, there was a time when he couldn't escape. Uh, and, and who knows what, I mean, maybe Meade finally would have attacked and the Confederates would have repulsed them at great loss. And it, I mean, there's no, way as, uh, there's no way to say what would have happened because we don't know what would have happened. We can speculate in lots of directions. There are some things that I think are worth looking at in terms of approaches to leadership. At different points, you have key decisions to make. And some of them make one decision, and some make another decision. And there are patterns that we can detect. And there are patterns of aggressiveness in one army, and there are patterns of caution in the other army. And, 
and the, the overall performances of the armies are marked by certain kinds of outcomes, I think, that flow from those different patterns. Most of Lee's victories flowed from the fact that he was willing to take risks. And I think a number of the Union failures flowed from precisely the same thing. They, were, they should not have been failures. They were because of caution. <coughs> Chancellorsville should have been a United States victory, not a Confederate victory. It was a Confederate victory because Lee was breathtakingly daring and Hooker let him get away with it. McClellan in the seven days, the same thing. Should have been a United States victory, it was a Confederate victory because you had such a cautious approach on one side. And so it's, I think those patterns are interesting to look at. Uh, but we can't know what would have happened that didn't happen. All we can know is what did happen. In spite of the, uh, in spite of Lincoln, Know, repeating over and over, no, I want you to, I want each of his army commanders to, to press the advantage, um, and being frustrated. How do you think that there was some effect on the Northern Army's leadership because of the frequent turnover? Do you think that, that that having that frequent turnover actually helped make them more averse to taking I, risks? I do. I do. If what you know is that five other guys have lost the job before you, I think the question of job security might come into play in a way. Does Lee really think you have? Lee offered his resignation after Gettysburg in a sort of this, you know, people, I hear that people are saying mean things about me. And I know that if you've lost the support of the people, then you should step down. And so I think for the good of the cause, I should step down. I think these, this is one of these worst performances of the war. <laughs> That's what he says. That's what he says. And what's, what's the reaction to that from Jefferson Davis? He doesn't take it seriously. Oh, General Lee, General Lee, there's no one like you. You're Mr. Wonderful. Of course I'm not going to get rid of you. You're the all we have, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's ex and then Lee says, oh, okay, then I'll stay. My question is, did, Re, did Lee really think that they were going to get rid of him because of Gettysburg? Do you think he really, I, I've set this up so there's only one answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, no, he doesn't really think that. He doesn't. He, that's, if one thing Lee doesn't have to worry about is somebody <coughs> looking over my shoulder and are they going to take my job away from me if something doesn't go perfectly? No, that is not going to happen. Does Meade think that? Yes. When they woke Meade up in the middle of the night, he thought he was going to be arrested. That's what he wrote to his wife. I thought they'd come to arrest me. I didn't know what I'd done. Why would they get me out of bed at 2 in the morning? Lee, awakened at 2 in the morning, would never have the thought they'd come to arrest me because they're not happy with me. I think it makes a huge difference that you have no stability at the top in the Army of the Potomac. And you have complete stability at the top, the very top, in the Army Northern Virginia from June 1st, 1862 to Appomattox. There's one person in charge. And everybody knows who it is and who it will continue to be as long as Lee wants to be there. In the Army of the Potomac, you have six people who are in that position in the same period. Justin? We talked a lot about how, I guess, the public saw the two different sides after the war. <clears throat> how did, I guess, the generals and the men themselves see what they had done. You know, like I, I thought Custer, you know, or not Custer, but um, Pickett, you know, certainly seemed devastated. Within the Union side, they had a devastated. victory, but, you know, in some units, heavy losses. How did the men themselves and the generals themselves see? I think the men in the Army of the Potomac were very happy with themselves after Gettysburg. It's their first really, it's a victory in a way that Antietam wasn't a victory. I, I think it's a huge thing to them. And you saw that landscape there. I mean, there's no other landscape in the world in terms of the monumental landscape. That is the most, there are more monuments within three miles of Gettysburg, a three mile radius of <coughs> Gettysburg than anywhere else in the world. There are more than 1,500 of them, 1,500. And they're virtually all United States monuments. I'm sure you noticed that. There are almost no Confederate monuments there. They're Confederate <coughs> state monuments. But the Union regiments went back there and put up monuments to what they had accomplished. So they took tremendous pride in it, tremendous pride in it, and continued to for the rest of their lives. And it grew and grew and grew uh, for the rest of their lives, as those things do. Uh, 
it's it is it's it's interesting. This is just a little aside, but it's it's apropos of this. I met my father in Washington last week. They had a ceremony at the World War II Memorial for World War II veterans, and they had 50 veterans there. My dad was the only one not in a wheelchair, and they were taking Peace 92. They were taking pictures of them everywhere. He was in the Atlantic and the Pacific. He was in the Navy, and a school group from uh, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, zeroed in on my father and kind of surrounded him and. And it was wonderful. He signed autographs, they took pictures and all of this. But my dad got next to, there's a plaque there that talks about the he, all of these men were heroes in World War II. And my dad said, well, of course, we weren't all heroes in World War II. There aren't very many heroes. We were all people who went into the Army or Navy when we were supposed to, but we weren't all heroes. Well, people become heroes retrospectively, and the language gets hyperbolic retrospectively. And that certainly happens with Gettysburg, I think. It becomes a great touchstone for veterans of the Army of the Potomac because they don't have lots of places to go and really feel that good about themselves, but they have that one. And it becomes not just their great victory, but it becomes the great turning point. And the Confederates were complicit in that because they argued endlessly about whether if Longstreet had just done what he should have done, wouldn't Lee have won, and then we would have won the war, and then it would have all been different. So it all is at Gettysburg, and it's all Longstreet's fault, which is totally unfair. It's not all Longstreet's fault. Who knows what would have happened, even with the Confederate victory. But both sides contributed to this notion that Gettysburg was the great, great turning point. And the first national cemetery being there helped, didn't start out as a, did, you, did you walk into the cemetery? I saw it from a little ways away. I mean, that all of those things contribute to Gettysburg's becoming. Lee never went north again. Um, so it's the high watermark of the Confederacy. That, I thought that was odd even as a kid. Seemed to me it was a low watermark. They really got beaten there. But it's described as the high watermark. It seems sort of odd uh, to me. Yeah, along that line, um, I thought it was surprising like, how many Confederate flags you see around town now. And whether the oh. people visit and just because see that they as, sell yeah. better, yeah, I mean. the art that they sell there is overwhelmingly Confederate. In all the shops, in all the tchotchke shops that you can go and get stuff, it's it's all Confederate. It's Lee and Jackson and Longstreet. It's hard <coughs> to find a picture that has Grant in it. Nobody wants to buy Grant. Everybody wants to buy Lee. It's 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 it's, it's almost biz it's bizarre how uneven it is. It really is very strange. It, very strange. Yes, uh, Barbara. Question. Um, so at the end, um, our in the second group I was with on Saturday, there was a fair amount of discussion about the carnage that was mm -hmm. left and kind of the. I just kept standing there thinking about the disease and the, the fact that so, right? Do you have any comment on, on like what that whole oh, mess? It's, it's unimaginable, and there's yeah. no FEMA. The, the government yeah, does not. In to clean it nobody up. comes in to clean it up. The 2,400 people who lived in Gettysburg are still there when the armies march away, and there are 5,000 dead horses littering the countryside. Thousands of dead men and dying men, every building overflowing with wounded men. And no, I mean, well, some volunteers come in to help, but there is no official governmental intervention to take care of this. It's just, it's, they talked about just this, this biblical plague of flies that came into Gettysburg and stayed for months. Just swarms of flies everywhere. And so you drag the horses into big piles, and you douse them with kerosene, and you burn them, and you first bury the dead temporarily, and then you disinter all of them and bury them again, bury the Union ones in the cemetery. The Confederate ones mostly went to Richmond uh, after the war. But it's, it's just, it's, it's unimaginably, unspeakably awful for the people who remain at the end after a big battle, after a big battle. Jeff? So I had heard, um, from our from our marine, that, uh -huh. um, apparently vultures had not been, oh, yeah. Yeah. and they've vultures. never left. Yeah, so that's true. Well, they say that they say so many things at Gettysburg. <laughs> I, you know, it was the. It was I know the, there are vultures there now. Right. I don't know if there were never vultures there before, and if these just came and kind of liked it, right. and so now <laughs> they live there, and their kids like that's it too, so they just stay. 
it was the, the vultures was crazy, and then the the maggots. That part about the Confederate forces who weren't treated immediately because obviously priority goes to the Federals. The Federals wounds are cleaned with the same sponges that I mean it, they're they're used and reused and reused. Right. So they all get infected and because of the Confederates. No, 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 no. Just, no. no. Treating the treating the Federals like getting those guys off the right. battlefield first, first, and, first and and no, that's what I mean by using the same sponges. Not, but not on the Confederates. Like some of the Federals the Union, no, so yeah. worse. The Confederates yeah. hang out yeah. on the battlefield. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so the, the Confederates hang out on the battlefields for the couple of days. They don't get picked up, right? And they've got like maggots hatching okay. that actually start yeah. to. I'm the one that passed out, so... You <laughs> <laughs> what the Confederate surgeons discovered fairly early right. in the war is that maggots are salubrious for wounds in the extremities. Right. They only eat the dead, they only eat the bad flesh, they don't eat the good flesh. So maggots were considered a good thing, not a bad thing. No, and that blew my mind. Yeah, they're a good thing, not a bad thing. But the notion that somehow one side's getting worse treatment than the other, or bad sponges are... No, he, what he meant was that he, he treats the, the doctor treats you, right. and he treats the next person. Exactly. He's just passing your Right, oh no, absolutely. So the federal forces actually but, but, it, but it's not a confederate federal. I would be, I would have an extreme amount of of uh, wariness about buying into that. Oh, so that's, it, so that's it, it is true that they don't they don't know about. I mean, it's just before. Unfortunately, the Civil War is just before key medical breakthroughs. So, do the surgeons know to disinfect instruments? No, they do not. They wipe them on their pants. They they have bloody buckets that they put their knives and saws into and just take them out. So, there's absolutely no attention to that on either side. And physicians, they were usually surgeons on either side, treated both sides, and there would be Union and Confederate wounded. And it, it's, uh, so it's, I, I don't think that, that's a great, another great story, yeah. but I'm not sure there's much to that story. The, the other one about the lack of what we would consider a shocking lack of awareness of the most basic things to do in medical care is absolutely true, right. absolutely true. And as I know I said before, if you get wounded here, triage just puts you over there, and you either live or you don't. There's nothing they can do for you. Give you laudanum. I mean, they can ease your pain if they've got laudanum or some opiate. One of you asked. So, we hear that parts of Gettysburg are haunted, or we heard rumors Well, how can you avoid people? You see 90 nitwits uh, walking up and down <laughs> the streets every night, leading groups of tourists. <laughs> and and, there, and, there, and there is a, there's a ghost. Here is how that started. Talk about entrepreneurial acumen. <laughs> This guy named Mark Nesbitt, many, many years ago, wrote a book about the ghosts of Gettysburg. A little book, it's about this thick. And he had found all the ghost stories of Gettysburg and put them in this little book. And it sold well. Guess what? He found more ghosts. There was Ghosts of Gettysburg 2. And then Ghosts of Gettysburg 3. And then Ghosts of Gettysburg the highlights. And then there were ghost tours of Gettysburg. And then more ghost tours of Gettysburg. And now there's a ghost. You can't walk nine feet in Gettysburg without running into a ghost story. And here is where, you know, Hickenlooper's younger daughter, and, and it's just, it's just gone. It's a viral plague on Gettysburg as far as I'm concerned. And to me, the biggest and most heartbreaking dimension of it is all these people staggering along, you know, with Twinkies falling out of their pockets at night, <laughs> listening to these stupid ghost stories. Every house, nobody stops and says, gosh, every house has a ghost? They're just, oh, another ghost, oh, another ghost. <laughs> just unbelievable, unbelievable, so unbelievable. Now we see why in Gettysburg get along. <laughs> just incredible, <laughs> incredible. I, I wish you had, now I'm going to, I hope I can get to sleep tonight without thinking about how much I dislike <laughs> the ghosts at Gettysburg industry. It's just incredible. And it's way before the vampires, and I mean, that's sort of where we're going. Uh, I'm waiting for them. Abraham Lincoln Ghostbuster. That would be the next thing to do there, a ghost hunter or ghost, it's not just vampires, it's ghosts. And it all started, here's how that actually started, there's one place where even the locals said the germ of this entire viral phenomenon came from this place on the northern day's field uh, 
in between Oak Hill and the Union position on Seminary Ridge, a bunch of the Confederates from Iverson's North Carolina Brigade were buried in big pits in this little, and you can see there's still a depression there where they were buried. They'd long since been disinterred and they were called Iverson's Pits. The locals called them that. And they talked about how for years, whatever was planted there grew, it would grow a little bit taller where all those dead Confederates had been buried. The, 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 the nutrients were such that you could look in the field and say there are Iverson's Pits because the wheat would be a little higher or the grass would be a little bit higher. And the locals would say that they could imagine that they heard noises at Iverson's pits, and it was because those men had been butchered so needlessly. Their commander cowering behind the log up on Oak Hill and not going in with his own men. It was such a terrible slaughter that their souls were restive. And so the big pits filled <coughs> with Iverson's men were a place where the locals would steer clear. Uh, after the war. That's where, that's the beginning of the ghosts at Gettysburg, and then it's just, uh, and that part is true. I mean, they did have those stories about Iverson's Pits, but all the rest, and the skulls everywhere, and the little witch things everywhere, and the, uh, it's just, it's just amazing to me. It's a, it shows that there is absolutely no basement to which our culture will not descend. Uh, in this kind of stuff. You can get money. Talk about a sucker born every minute. I mean, P.T. Barnum had it right. Troops of suckers born every minute. Troops of them. And they all have ghost pins on around Gettysburg. You can spot them. There's a nitwit right there. You've been on the ghost tour. Oh, there's so many ghosts at Gettysburg. I didn't know that. Oh, was there a battle here too? I mean, this gets up in our attitude. They go to Gettysburg for the ghosts and find out, oh, Abraham Lincoln came here. Oh, that's right. He's a vampire hunter. <laughs> Sort of heartbreaking, actually, <laughs> on some level. It really is. <coughs> Justin? So you're not a fan of Longstreet's ghost, then? <laughs> no, it's his horse hero's ghost that I'm really drawn to. Poor hero. Poor hero. 17 hands tall and never really appreciated like Traveler. Even the horses, Lee's horse even gets more ink than Longstreet's horse. Lee's stuff. Pardon? Lee's horse is stuffed. No, Lee's horse is not stuffed. Stonewall no, Jackson's, Stonewall horse, Jackson's is horse is stuffed. Lee's horse, they used to have his bones on display at W&L. Traveler's skeleton, the first time I went there, there it was. And the, the, some of the frat boys at W&L one time had a dog skeleton that they put beside it and said, this is Traveler as a child. <laughs> Which I think is a good sense of humor. <laughs> then they buried all the bones eventually. They're buried right outside the, the chapel now. So poor Traveler's bones are at rest. Stonewall Jackson's horse is still at VMI. You can still go look at it. It's this sort of, I mean, the poor thing, it's, it's, it got a kind of shampoo and a fluff about three years ago and they spruced it up some. It had stitches and big bear spots and now they kind of fixed that a little bit, but it's, it's not pretty. Did you, are you the one who mentioned ghosts, Jeff? Oh, Carol. <laughs> oh, what about the chair? Oh, yeah. Are you going to tell them about the chair? What about the chair? Did it move by itself? Was it a rocking chair that moved? No. Oh, oh no, about the, the, Somebody, who was the, it that brought up the chair when we were in class last time? About if they could, that they should bring a chair. Oh. Oh, yeah. Did you take chairs? Did anybody in here take a chair? No, 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 James Longstreet would not have had a chair, and Robert E. Lee wouldn't have had a chair, and Winfield Scott Hancock wouldn't have had a chair, and so I'm really glad that you did not have chairs. <laughs> not a single chair among the Darden Brigade. You were there without <laughs> chairs. That's very important. Very they important. Had, they had horses to sit over. I guess we haven't taken the segue for you. <laughs> I've just noticed that there's a problematical area right over here in this room, and, and vibes emanate from this pretty much this section right here. And uh, but that's all right.
<laughs> Every group is a, is a group with different personalities and interests. <laughs> How many of how many of the ghost books did you buy while you were there? <laughs> so we just saw you can get them autographed, and you don't even have to go to the author. Just find a good medium, and they will. And all of a sudden, the signature will appear. Well, we were at the Fairfield Inn, so I think. I, Fairfield no, Inn. That's a historic inn. But so I asked the owner if it was true, and he wouldn't answer. And then so if what was true. It was hot. Or like, oh, oh, it's no. it <laughs> 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 about the lights being turned The wife would have told you there's lots of ghosts there. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm even confirmed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Stewart's ghost. Stewart's ghost? Yeah, you still can't find me. Bada boom. That's right. Give us a rim shot on that. That's right. That's, well, it's always nice to end on a high note. We have ten minutes left now. I don't know whether it's possible to reel you back in. Meade was called before the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War to testify about his behavior at Gettysburg, and so was Sickles, and so were many others. And there were very hard questions leveled at Meade. I think I already know what the answer to this is from our earlier conversation in here, but I can, I want, is there anybody in here, there might be one person, who a person so daring as to say Longstreet should have been removed from command, is there anybody in here who thinks that Meade had done poorly enough so that he actually would be culpable in the wake of Gettysburg for a major failure in not pursuing. Is there any, you, you just, just did Laura. raise your hand. Just well, Laura. I said it too on the battlefield. You did, you said that too. She and did. Give, okay, <laughs> give us your 30 second <laughs> argument for that. They thanked me for my contrarian perspective. Um, <laughs> I, I just feel like it was such, it had so much magnitude that I'm not sure he could be trustworthy going forward. I mean, I know that you don't want to, doing another change up at the top and you don't really have good replacements for him is just more turmoil for the army and so maybe that would be an argument against doing it obviously that could be a strong argument but I just feel like he's there for 10 days and he didn't do anything and it's hard to imagine that in a, in a comparable position later what if he isn't an aggressor like how are we going to win this war if we have a general who's not an aggressor and who doesn't take advantage of opportunities it seems You're like probably the war's not. going to go on forever if you can't get someone who, even when they create their own opportunity, doesn't follow it, doesn't go in, go with it. Okay, that's it. Now uh, we want here come a response, Justin. I was I was going to agree in a lot of ways. I was going to specifically for me the the biggest mistake he made <coughs> would just be in not using that reserve he had to immediately, right to immediately oppress the you know, with the counterattack. In terms of if I saw twelve thousand five hundred men marching anyway, I probably would have alerted my reserve expecting them to come directly in the middle. And so um, that right there, I think they could have, could have had a fantastic counterattack there, uh, in many ways probably broken the Confederate line. And then what happens from there, I don't know if I necessarily would move any troops from the rest of the positions, but uh, that's a, just an, a, a very basic, you know, expected tactical move is if there's a huge attack that fails, you have an immediate counterattack. And I guess I would say that that probably tells me that <clears throat> What happened at Gettysburg, in large part, probably wasn't directly due to anything Meade really did. It just wasn't who he was. He wasn't. It, it just wasn't in him. He wasn't a person to be in hot pursuit right after winning a victory. And that that leads me to to question. Well, then, is a lot of what happened at Gettysburg because it seems like from both sides, neither of them were expecting this battle. Really, they weren't. And no, so. And so it seems like a lot of the outcomes really hinged on things that were really beyond the control of the, the men at the top. So, Michelle. And also, like, what we had this discussion with our mariner, it's just like, he didn't know, I mean, it's obvious for us what he would find, but for him and for everybody at that point, it wasn't obvious what he would encounter if he had chosen to pursue. No, of course it wasn't. No. So maybe they would be waiting for an attack so, or they didn't know how, I mean, how many casualties there were exactly. Because, I mean, you cannot just go on the battlefield and count. I mean, we know how many people died there and how many the Confederates lost, but that was not that obvious, you know, how many. 
It's, they, they certainly didn't have an exact count, but these are two veteran armies, and you, you were on that ground. If you're looking out over that ground from Cemetery Ridge, you know that there have been huge casualties on the part of the troops that were coming towards you, huge. And you have, you've captured, you have a huge number of prisoners, there's a huge number of dead and wounded men in front of you. You have a very good sense that these units that have come towards you have been really broken in this assault. They're, yes? I was just going to say, I thought that um, Meade at Battle of Chancellorville was arguing that Hooker should have pursued. He did. So I don't think it's a fair assessment to say that he doesn't have it in him. I think that you might criticize his assessment of the situation in Gettysburg, and maybe he didn't make the best decision, but he, it appears, thought that it was not advisable to pursue them. And so, but doesn't mean he was like not an aggressive person. And then in, I think it was Fredericksburg, he was the only one who like broke the line. So he does He did break the line, but that was, he was at, he was pretty far down in, he's a division commander yeah. there. His troops broke the line. At, at Chancellorsville, he complained that Hooker didn't use all his men, including Meade's. Meade's, Meade's Corps didn't fight very much at Chancellorsville. And he thought it should have fought more, which makes it a little odder that he would have his largest corps very nearby and not have them committed. I guess my question is, did Meade, obviously they didn't pursue, and so there's no question about what we the way we withdrew, but given the way he withdrew, it surprised me when we Fairfield in and learned just how dispersed the withdrawal was through the pass and then down the Fairfield Road. It seemed like they really, they obviously were trying to get to the river as fast as possible, but they were kind of strung out. Well, they the took many roads because they had so many trains that they had to move. Again, I didn't make up the 50 mile, no. that, and so they are spread out. They're really spread out. Which was my criticism of me, given how spread out they are. Um, it seems like they were a pretty big target. It's part of spreading out to that degree because he didn't think there would be an immediate pursuit. I mean, if, if you were really concerned about they're going to launch a counterattack, wouldn't you have concentrated your withdrawal? You, you can't because degree? the roads then were so, we can't, it's hard to imagine how bad the roads were then and to move what are still almost 50,000 men and thousands and thousands of animals and thousands of wagons. You can't do that on one road. I mean, it would take, you have to, the idea is to get as many roads as possible so that you can get a better flow of movement. If you're trying to move on one road, you are absolutely a sitting duck. I mean, yet nothing would be happening. It's, I can't, I've read a lot about it, and I know I can't imagine what it's like to try to maneuver thousands of men, a mid-19th century army, on small roads with all the encumbrances that they had. That, I mean, it's just, I, I've read lots of descriptions about it, but I can't quite imagine it. <coughs> I know how hard it is to move 100 students across a battlefield. And we often line up and try to maintain formation for 50 yards, and of course, it doesn't happen. So it's, that's why they're all spread out. In, in the same light, though, isn't it, can't you say it'd be very hard for, like me, to maneuver 30,000 troops? It's not like they can ambush this huge train from the woods on the side. I mean, they're coming down the roads, too, and have to somehow either get around or come on from behind. A, a goal is often to get an enemy retreating because the idea is if you can make contact with the rear element of a retreating force, you have a huge advantage. And I just, um, it, it seems to me that it's reasonable to expect that Meade would have tried. I think he had two options. The, the obvious one, to me anyway, is the immediate one. And if he hadn't had Sedgwick, I wouldn't argue for that because he, he, the troops had been moved around. They were mixed up. The Confederates actually broke the line at one point. But he has a veteran corps commander right there with 12,000 men. That's a, that, that is an, an ideal reserve to have to exploit some kind of opportunity. McClellan had the same thing at Antietam. He had his biggest corps right there and didn't deploy it when he broke Lee Center. So th that's just hard for me to understand. Um, but it's true that he didn't know what was on Seminary Ridge. It's true that he didn't know any of the things that we know. He couldn't have known those things. What was your sense of who actually controls? What level of leadership is most important once a battle starts going? The guys at the bottom. 
Well, okay, the, what do you mean uh, by the bottom? Okay, so, so well, <laughs> not, not on the ground, but yeah, but it's, uh, it's your it's your brigade. It's the old yeah. army slogan: an army of one. An army of one. Well, <laughs> maybe that's taking it to an extreme. I think it is, but but, <laughs> but it's it's going to be, uh, I guess, what would be your equivalent today of your mid-level managers, your supervisors. It's it's the people who are actually giving the orders to the guys who are attacking that point in the line. It's not it's not the guy back at the edge of the trees mm -hmm. who, who is looking through the spyglass. I mean, the, the, at that point, the, the die is cast, and you're not, you're not going to communicate anything else. And they're just going to move where they're going to move, and there's going to be confusion beyond what you were able to foresee. Yeah. And the outcomes are going to be what they are. And then it, as things come back up the chain of command, then you make more decisions. But, but I think in that moment, the most important thing is, is the decisions that are made by the people on the ground right there. Anybody had other thoughts about that? Walking around and listening. What, what, what? Luis? Um, just to uh, recap, so the first guy after a thousand, um, what's his name? The, the, the regiment? Yeah. It, okay, Colonel commands a regiment. How many? It's a thousand on paper at Gettysburg. It's about 350 men. That's yeah, the yeah. average regiment is 350 That's men. We are a company in this room. A regiment has ten companies, we're a company, and our commander is a captain. There's a captain in charge of us. And there's a colonel in charge of ten times us. Yeah, not that guy, the other one. Yeah, I think uh, around three, 300. Three, three thousand, yeah. Uh -huh. But the guy that has uh, more maneuver and more ability to conduct different routes. I mean, he will get orders, but he's the one that, that is deploying them more frequently. So that, yeah, it sounds like you're talking about Strong Vincent's level of command, which he has four regiments under him. So he has four colonels under him, and he, he has four regiments. That's what a brigadier, somebody in command of a brigade would have. We've run past our time two minutes. Go ahead. I was just surprised by the, uh, compared to today's military, of what limited role small unit leadership really seemed to play a part of like the captains and stuff like that outside of scouting little round top, it seemed it was mostly to count heads and say, okay, make sure they're to the left and they're to the right, and that was about the level of authority you were given, um, which to me was somewhat surprising just compared to what I understand of today's military, where a sergeant that's got three people and is responsible for a lot more, that seems to have a lot more autonomy in his decision-making skills. What's one reason for that, do you think? What, what do you have to do with, what, what maintains unit integrity? And I'm going to just run over here a few minutes. How do you maintain integrity in a Civil War infantry unit? Mm -hmm. The man in control is charge. Really different. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really, I mean, it really is shoulder to shoulder. That's how you control people. They know, I know I'm supposed to be here. You're supposed to be here. Justin's supposed to be, that's where we are. That's where we are. And, and our officers know where we're supposed to be, and our flag is right in the middle. We know where we're supposed to be, basically, vis-a-vis -vis our flag. We've got, we've got uh, five companies on one side and five companies on the other side. We know where the flag is supposed to be. And the only way they can get us to do what they want us to do is if we are right here moving the way they want us to move. And if Justin gets shot, Heather moves up so that now she is on my shoulder. It's, it's literally shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder contact. Of the and that is there's just there's not nearly as much sort of independent action by small groups apart from the skirmishers who would be thrown out every regiment would throw out skirmishers who would go out in front way out in front sometimes and be widely spaced but but once the fighting starts it's really these linear tactics they are shoulder to shoulder that's how they control people it's the only way they think they can control them the implication though for me was more as people are moving up and being completely untested because you've literally been assigned as a more or less babysitter to count 35. That's a little heads. harsh, I think. They're a little bit more than that. No, uh, you're not really coming up with strategic plans. Not, no, not no, no, much. no. So as you're elevated to these upper levels of command, mm -hmm. you've had very little practice in a smaller formation is what, where I was really going with that. So it makes a lot more of those, <clears throat> hey, you're all of a sudden in charge, a lot more impressive in some ways of you really had no experience, None. no preparation, no. we had no way to know if you were going to be nope. successful. That's true, this. that's true. We, we talked about this. Lee had never commanded 10 men in battle. 
before he took command of the Army in Northern Virginia. He went from commanding nobody in battle to 90,000 men. That was his jump. But the officers at the time, uh, to come back to your comment, they said the absolute backbone of the veteran units were the sergeants. Just, just as people say now, some do anyway. I mean, the non-commissioned officers were absolutely crucial. And when you had huge casualties among them, is when you really had problems of controlling units. Uh, you, it was those veteran leaders. Well, so there we go. You all, you know, yes. I was wondering, uh, you do other tours to other uh, battlefields? I take my students. They don't have to go. We do optional ones. We went to Chancellorsville last weekend, and we're going to Petersburg this Saturday. If anybody wants to go to Petersburg, send me an email, and I'll send you all the information about it. And if you want to go to a really fascinating slideshow, and I mean slides, it's a it's an anthropological experience for you. The click of this, the, the heat of the light. It's a slideshow of about 200 Civil War slides. I'm going to do that in my class later this semester too. If you're interested in that, send me an email and I will tell you. And I supply junk food and commentary for the slideshow. <laughs> and at Petersburg, we'll walk around for about five hours and see where the mine blew up. And uh, that's it. This was fun. Thank you. Thank you.